In my recent video on the subject of electric trains, how they're powered and so forth, a few people mentioned the somewhat unusual system used on the Docklands Light Railway. In fact, I've had a few people ask about this over the years, so today I thought I'd make a quick video looking into that, what it is, and why. Now, the Docklands Light Railway is an automated electric light rail system in East London, edging into South East London. It's Britain's second modern light rail system after the Tyne and Weir Metro. It was designed as a low-capacity short-distance system, but it's become a major component of London's public transport network and serves many areas that would otherwise have no rail link. In fact, what's happened more than once is that the DLR has come along to fulfil a demand for a rail link, then it became so crowded that they had to build another rail link. It's electrically powered, like most of the commuter lines into London. It uses a third rail which delivers a traction current at 750 volts DC. The return current goes along the running rails. Now, third rail electrical pickup is common in London and has been for over 110 years. It's cheaper than overhead wires, it's less intrusive, and it's well suited to short distance routes with frequent stops. But the DLR does things a bit differently. The problem with the older third rail system is that you have a deadly conductor rail out in the open. It's not very safe. At the time these railways were built, I think the attitude towards safety was, well, you shouldn't have been on the line in the first place. Not much comfort for the unfortunate plate layer who makes a misstep, though. Unfortunately, we're stuck with this system because there's just too much of it. The government has effectively banned future third rail lines other than metros, which solves one problem but creates another, in that unelectrified lines branching off the third rail network cannot be brought in line with the rest. But that's a whole other issue. The DLR was built between the 1980s and the 2010s with a number of proposals to extend in the future. Importantly, though, it does not have to be compatible with any other railway. Its trains do not share tracks with anyone else. So its designers took the opportunity to give it a new kind of pickup. It does use a third rail, but the current is picked up from under the rail, using a sprung pickup shoe. The sides and top of the rail are covered over by a plastic shield. As well as the obvious safety benefits, this also provides some protection from the other problem with third rail systems. The rails can ice over in cold weather, which inhibits electrical pickup. That's not such a problem on the DLR. The diameter of the conductor rails varies. The Lewisham and Woolwich Arsenal sections were built with a wider cross section to reduce the distance between electrical substations. The relatively short distance between substations is one of the problems with third rail systems, which is another reason why they're not preferred over long distance lines. Now, I should point out that the DLR isn't the first or only system to use this, it's just the first and only such system in London. Interestingly, the DLR might have used a different mode of current collection. One early suggestion was that the line would have shared track with the Underground into Tower Hill and or Aldgate East. The Underground uses not only a third rail, but a fourth. The current return goes along a centre rail. Alternatively, it might have used overhead wires. Another early proposal would have seen part of the route run along Mile End Road as a tram, and these days those tend to use overhead pickup. Although I should point out that at the time, the most recent trams to run in London used a conduit system, picking up from a buried third rail in the middle of the track. Again, that's a whole other story. In fact, in 1987, one DLR train was fitted for overhead pickup on a test track in Manchester. At the time, technology was being evaluated for potential use in the city's planned tram network. One last point of note. Have you noticed the wire between the rails? That takes the place of a conventional signalling system. Rather than use line-side signals like a conventional railway, information can be transmitted directly from the control centre to the train. It's a key part of driverless operation. So, that's a brief look at how one of my favourite rail systems is powered. I realise that it is extraordinarily nerdy to have a favourite rail system, but it's a living, I suppose. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If so, please do leave a like, and if it takes your fancy, subscribe for more.
I would like to thank my donors on Ko-fi, on Patreon, and here on YouTube for your generous support. You are the conductor rail to my underslung pickup. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio.